Let's talk about when guns become hand-to-hand -hand combat weapons. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. So, something that occurred to me in the last couple of days talking about military model swords used within the age of firearms, modern firearms. Obviously, hand weapons have been around um, for <laughs> since the dawn of time, but what we commonly class as firearms, guns, have been around really in warfare since the 14th century, um, certainly in Europe and uh, you could say in China and Persia and places like that as well. Um, but they haven't really been a major player on the battlefield um, until really the, the 15th, 16th century. Obviously, originally in the 15th century, most commonly encountered or, or most important in warfare, shall we say, in their very large form, i.e. cannons, bombards, things like this, mortars. But um, handguns, that is handheld firearms, obviously did start to play a part on the battlefield in the, from the middle of the 15th century onwards um, and became really important in the 16th century um, and, of course, more and more important ever after that. But when we're talking about things like this uh, end of the 19th century infantry officer's sword, you'll find a lot of people um, on the internet will say, well, you know, these didn't really have any place on the battlefield um, by the end of the 19th century because of the effectiveness of firearms. Now, those firearms in question, I happen to have one here. So this is a Martini Henry with the uh, great long bayonet. <laughs> there are various forms, but this is the particularly long one uh, fitted on a Martini Henry. And people point out that by the time that firearms like these came along, and certainly later, um, like magazine um, rifles, which even have a higher rate of fire, once breech-loading firearms come along, then the days of hand weapons are really numbered. And that's basically true, okay? I'm not, I'm not a denier. I'm not trying to deny that that, that is, in, you know, a fact. And uh, once we start to get um, pistols, when we're talking about officers or kind of um, personal protection, once we get pistols which have multi-shot capacity, then indeed hand weapons start to become less and less of a... Um, less and less important, both in terms of self-defense and on the battlefield. But you've got to bear in mind that these multi-shot, reliable, um, and certainly breech-loading versions of these um, pistols didn't come along uh, really until about the 1860s, um, when we're talking about pin fire, um, and then when we're talking about centre fire, really the 1870s, but uh, in fact muzzle loading versions, percussion cap um, versions of these, uh, were still prevalent until the 1870s, in fact, uh, certainly in the American West, people were still using um, uh, black powder versions, uh, uh, muzzle loading versions of these, until the 1870s, even though cartridge versions were um, available by that point, and in fact they did convert a lot of the um, muzzle loading versions to breech loaders. This is actually an Adams um, 1867 model um, and these were used, uh, these were essentially an adaptation of the earlier um, percussion cap version which had been around since the 1850s. Now what I'm not going to talk about in this video is um, the use of these in the conventional hand-to-hand -hand combat way often with a bayonet or um, application of the butt. And as always on this channel, we like to talk about the butt and we like to talk about penetration, but uh, that's actually not what I'm talking about in this video. So what am I talking about? Well, there's an interesting factor I was thinking about, um, and it came up when we're looking at the situations when swords and knives and various close combat weapons were still used in the age of repeating and highly reliable and highly accurate firearms, for example in World War I. And you'll all know that uh, trench weapons were used. Okay, Now, in trench warfare, We've got plenty of pistols around. We've got things like hand grenades, which and hand grenades, I think, don't get their uh, due credit. Hand grenades were incredibly important in um, trench combat and referred to in British sources of the time as simply bombs. Uh, they weren't usually known as grenades. Grenade is a word of Spanish origin, uh, but they were usually referred to as bombs uh, in the First World War. That was the slang name for them, certainly in the British Army. And uh, officers, for example, yes, indeed, had put their swords away by the end of 1914. So if you look at photos from World War I, you'll see that British officers were carrying swords in 1914, uh, and the World War I was highly mobile uh, for, for most of the beginning of the war. But then as it settled down into trench warfare, um, in November 1914, the order went around for officers to put their swords away. 
and if they needed something to wave they took to walking sticks and uh, swagger sticks and umbrellas and all sorts of other things um, but for close combat they by that point pretty much relied on their pistols and indeed various forms of knife dagger and trench club and things like this for trench raids and those were carried specifically if you knew you were going on a trench raid but why? And that's the point of this video. So the simple fact is, if you're armed with some form of long rifle and bayonet, this is actually not something which is very easily manoeuvrable in a trench or in a building or in a room. Uh, this is a Martini Henry, so this is a, this is a firearm from the 1870s in this particular case. But even with the shorter rifles, the Mausers and the SMLEs and, and things like this of the First World War, the fact is that they're still quite long rifles and they still have, for the most part, quite long bayonets on them. So they're quite unwieldy objects. But the fact is that if someone jumps into a trench right in front of you or jumps out of a door in a building, remember lots of combat happened around uh, uh, shelled buildings and um, fortifications and going into villages and this kind of stuff. So if someone pops out right in front of you, and I know that in more recent uh, situations, I know people who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan and this has happened to them, it still happens in modern warfare, doesn't matter how effective your firearm is. It doesn't matter the fact that I can aim at something 800 yards away and stand a good chance of hitting it with whatever firearm I'm using, even if it's 500 yards away or whatever. Um, it doesn't matter how accurate your firearm is, it doesn't matter what rate of fire your firearm is, if someone suddenly appears in front of you armed with whatever, it could be another firearm or it could be a knife, it could be a screwdriver, the fact is this is no longer a very effective weapon. Now, when we look at bayonet fighting or, or musket fighting, as it's formulized in the, in the manuals, yes indeed, obviously you've got a stabbing implement that you can draw back and you can stab fairly close. You've got something that you can clout someone with, obviously with the butt end, bam, even with the middle of it, even with the barrel of it. So you've got something that you can use like a pugil stick or even a, a short quarter staff and you can strike with, but the fact is it's not really optimal in that situation and it's become a hand weapon. It might be a super effective firearm, but it's become a hand weapon. And this is even true with pistols. Now, if you look at modern self-protection stuff, you'll notice there's a lot of defense stuff where you're taught to put uh, a defensive um, part of your body up, usually, usually something like this, usually an arm up, and you draw back the pistol to very, very close and you unload your magazine uh, into the opponent at very close range. But there's one situation where that might be inadvisable or might be not possible for various reasons, and that is in a melee. The simple facts of this kind of messed up melee situation are that the people who are all around you are made up of a mixture of enemies and allies, friends, um, comrades. You don't want to shoot them, okay? You don't want to accidentally shoot them. Now that can happen in a number of ways. First of all, the fact is that with a pistol, there's a lot of margin for error, okay? So yes, you might miss the person who's trying to kill you with a knife or a gun or whatever, but uh, if you miss them, that might have even more dire consequences in that it might kill or injure the person who you're fighting alongside, who's one of your buddies, okay? now. Even if you don't miss them, even if you shoot the person right in front of you, the chances are that at point blank range that bullet's going to go through them and hit the person behind. And you don't know whether the person behind might be another enemy, so you might actually take out two enemies, uh, or it might go through them and hit one of the people you're fighting with. So in this situation it can become quite problematic. Now in, the terms, in terms of this pistol, this is a six shot pistol, if we're looking at World War I, British officers were armed with usually a Webley, sometimes Smith & Wesson, uh, and that would have been a six shot revolver. Yes you can reload it but not in the middle of a melee, so you've got six shots and you've got to choose what to do with those shots quite wisely in the split second, in the moment that someone's trying to kill you, either with another firearm, might be with a bayonet on the end of a rifle, it might be some kind of edged weapon that they're going crazy at you with, it might just be with their fists, it might be with a trench club, knuckle duster, all this kind of stuff, so you, you don't know. Um, so they're attacking with that, you're trying to decide what to do with your pistol in the meantime. You can't really physically block with this pistol, and certainly if you, if you do try and block an attack with it, and yeah, I suppose technically you could kind of stick a firearm in the way 
of someone swinging a machete or whatever at your head. Um, but if you're blocking with it, then you're not attacking with it. If you're repeatedly shooting the person who's attacking you, then you're not blocking in that time. You're shooting them, but the bullets are going into them or through them, but they're still attacking you with that weapon. They're not going to instantly drop down dead. That doesn't happen. Well, it does happen, but it happens not reliably. Um, even in hunting, uh, when you shoot an animal, it will run off um, quite often. And certainly in combat situations, whether it's police, whether it's um, you know civilian type um, combat situation, self-defense, or if it's in a, a war situation, you can't reliably expect the person's lights to just go straight out. Even uh, you know if you're trying to shoot them in the heart or the head then you might miss, you might not hit the desired organ, um, and nevertheless, they might still keep attacking you. So, really just to say that in this moment of melee, whether it's a World War I trench, or whether it's a modern self-defense um, situation, or a police situation, or a modern warfare situation, in the moment when your opponent suddenly appears in front of you, your opponent who you hadn't expected, and, and that's assuming they're in front, they might be behind you, okay, and that's just as likely. If you're uh, going into a house and clearing out a house with your very effective, very long range, very multi-shot and accurate rifle, you're going into a house and suddenly your opponent attacks you from here, or here, or here. Multiple opponents maybe, attacks your, your, your squad as well attacks your group of men, or suddenly you realize that one of your buddies behind you is being attacked. You spin around and point at them, and he's being attacked by someone with a machete or, or, or a knife or whatever. Uh, you can't shoot straight into the person because you'll shoot into your buddy behind them. Uh, so at that point, essentially it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, and you can't get around that. Now, when people talk about historical periods, I think they often remove the, their idea of the historical period from modern realities. We often, a lot of the things I've spoken about here, people would fully accept those things if they're talking about modern self-defense, modern crime, whatever, even modern warfare. But when people think about World War I, for example, or World War, World, World War II, um, I think, or even if we go back to the Victorian period, I think they often have an idealized and sanitized and clinical view of what combat was when combat's never been like that. Um, and if we look at World War I combat accounts, they're super, super messy, okay? Oftentimes, it did result in wrestling and punching and rolling around on the ground with people, even though they were using rifles. Let's bear this in mind. In World War I, they were using rifles and machine guns, which in some situations were more accurate, longer range, and more energy at the muzzle, more, more muzzle energy, than some modern rifles are. Okay, if we compare a World War I SM, SMLE 303 caliber, um, in some situations it will be a more effective weapon hitting someone at a thousand yards than a modern 5.56 millimeter um, AR-15 or <laughs> whatever you want to call it, or a British um, uh, SA-80, whatever, would be, okay? Um, the fact is that they had very effective firearms, um, but the fact is that if you're raiding a trench, if you're going into a building, these sorts of situations, doesn't matter how effective your firearm is, don't change within certain parameters. Okay, The fact is someone jumping out of a cupboard, someone bursting through a door, uh, someone dropping into your trench um, or into your dugout, uh, in that moment you're at point blank range and you're at punching, wrestling, stabbing range, okay? And your, your firearm at that point becomes a hand-to-hand -hand combat implement, okay? So there we go, just some uh, thoughts to go away with. The fact that uh, when we're talking about World War I and whether swords were or weren't useful, and obviously for the most part they were anachronistic, but remember, the first British kill scored in World War One was done with a cavalry sword on patrol. Um, someone yesterday in the discussion I was on was saying how, oh, well, you know, the cavalry sword didn't have any place on the battlefield in the age of the Maxim machine gun. The fact is those cavalry dudes were on patrol. They weren't carrying a Maxim machine gun. You couldn't carry a Maxim machine gun around with you. And they encountered a German patrol. And in that moment, the best thing to do was pull your sword out and run it through the um, opposing German. 
they didn't have time to uh, dismount and get their rifles out of their um, out of their holsters they didn't have time to call up the machine gun crew or anything like that they in the moment the best thing to do was pull out the sword and use it uh, and it's exactly the same with trench weapons it's exactly the same with knives today and you ask any law enforcement people is a person in a room with a knife a very dangerous thing yes they still are still the 21 foot rule applies and it certainly did in world war one as well anyway thanks for watching give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already and i'll see you really soon on the channel for another video cheers folks